By late February 1942, Allied forces in the Dutch East Indies were on the brink of collapse. Japanese troops had taken vast swathes of land and dozens of islands in a matter of a few weeks, while the Imperial Japanese Navy tightened the net around the Dutch colonial capital on Java. But the Allies had new naval commanders, who were determined to defend the island or go down trying. With the fall of Bali to Japanese troops by February 20th, 1942, the capital of the Dutch East Indies was isolated on the island of Java. The Japanese Navy now wanted to move quickly to subdue the island before reinforcements could be brought in from elsewhere by the Allies. The first Japanese invasion convoy bound for Java left Indochina on February 18th, followed the next day by a second convoy from the island of Jolo. Together they comprised more than 100 transports, carrying two infantry divisions and the headquarters of the 16th Army. In addition to the close escorts of these convoys, Japan deployed a huge naval force to oversee and protect the invasion. Covering forces were deployed north and south of Java to prevent Allied reinforcements from coming in or those in Java from making a getaway. On the Allied side, naval strength was much more limited. Allied ships had been operating under a unified Allied command known as Abdecom since January and had suffered a steady attrition of ships in battles with the Japanese. The latest casualties were the Dutch cruiser Tromp and destroyers Stuart and Piet Hein, which were damaged and sunk respectively while trying to hinder the enemy landings on Bali. The Allied naval force was under the overall command of Vice Admiral Conrad Helfrich, who had been keen to get onto the offensive against Japan for some time. His plans had been frustrated though, both by the need to escort Allied convoys and by fuel shortages which were starting to have an impact. This meant that when an Allied flying boat spotted the Eastern Japanese invasion convoy approaching on February 25th, a large proportion of Helfrich's force was miles to the west at Tanjong Priok. He hurriedly ordered ships to move to Surabaya, forming the combined striking force under Rear Admiral Karel Dorman. The combined force was built around the heavy cruisers Houston and Exeter. They'd be supported by the light cruisers Perth, Java and Dorman's flagship De Reuter. There was also a good number of destroyers with three Dutch, four American and three British. It was a decent sized force but an eclectic mix of ships. The cruisers all varied in age, specification and of course, nationality. On February 26th, Vice Admiral Helfrich received a report on the position of the Eastern enemy force and ordered Dorman to attack it that night. Dorman gathered his captains together for a conference, outlining the basics of a plan to travel around Madura Island and engage the Japanese. What was missing from the discussions though were details of how the ship would communicate and react in tactical situations. This was particularly tricky because as a multinational force, the ships under Dorman's command had done next to no training with each other and had no familiarity with how each other fought battles at sea. There was also a sizeable language barrier between Dorman and the English-speaking officers under his command. Nevertheless, the combined striking force left port at 6pm on February 26th, completing a patrol overnight that did not find any sight of the Japanese convoy. Dorman brought his ships back to Surabaya to refuel, but at 2.25, just as he was taking his ships into port, a message arrived reporting the enemy fleet just 40 miles to the northwest. The Allied force immediately reversed course and steamed to meet their opponents. The Japanese convoy in question was approaching rapidly. By 10am that morning, February 27th, it had passed Baywan Island having suffered no interruptions on its journey south. The escorting vessels were under the command of Rear Admiral Takeo Takagi, who had two Miyoko-class heavy cruisers supported by destroyer squadrons under Rear Admiral Shoji Nishimura and Raizu Tanaka, for a total of two light cruisers and 14 destroyers. At 11am, Rear Admiral Takagi got the first bit of intelligence that there may be an Allied force standing between him and Java. He launched a float plane from one of his heavy cruisers to get a visual, 
and by 12.35 he had reports filtering back about the position and course of the combined striking force. With Dorman ships initially heading away from him, Takagi continued to bring the convoy south to press on with the landing, but when Dorman turned north after 2pm, Takagi ordered the invasion ships to turn west out of harm's way. The rear admiral then increased speed and prepared to fight. A couple of hours later, at 4.10 the British destroyer Electra had the first sight of the enemy. Looming over the horizon was the light cruiser Jinsu, followed very soon after by a view of two Japanese heavy cruisers. The Japanese fleet spotted Dorman's force almost simultaneously and at 4.15 Nachi and Haguro opened fire with their 8-inch guns at a range of 28,000 yards. Two minutes later, without waiting for orders, Exeter returned fire, followed shortly after by Houston. The fire from both sides at this range was ineffective, but the Japanese cruisers had more large 8-inch guns in total, so it was only a matter of time until they got lucky. To do any real damage, the Allied ships were going to have to get closer to bring the guns of the light cruisers into play. This was easier said than done though, as Dorman was hamstrung by the slow speed of the destroyer Quarternair, which had engine trouble and could only make 26 knots. Even worse, all of the American destroyers behind this ship were also limited to this speed, as they had orders not to pass the Dutch ships in front of them. At 4.35, Rear Admiral Takagi launched the first of several torpedo attacks and kept up the barrage of gunfire on the Allied force. By 4.52, 39 torpedoes had been launched from as far away as Jinsu, 22,000 yards distant. Only one found its mark though, striking the destroyer Quarternair at 5.13 and causing it to sink within a few minutes. Matters got even worse for the Allies when at 5.08 a shell from Haguro hit Exeter and blew up in one of the ship's boiler rooms. Almost 40 sailors were killed instantly, with superheated steam venting from ruptured boilers. The heavy cruiser's speed was reduced to 11 knots and power to its main armament was cut off temporarily. Heavily damaged, Exeter turned hard to port to pull out of the Allied line. And then things went a bit wrong. The Allied cruisers following Exeter assumed they had missed a flag signal from Dorman on board De Reuter who they couldn't see and so followed Exeter's turn, leaving De Reuter steaming west on her own. Any kind of Allied cohesion then broke down as Dorman was forced to swing around to try and regain control of his fleet. A smokescreen was laid quickly by the destroyers to desperately try and hide the disordered cruisers from Japanese eyes. The Allied ships emerged from the smoke at 5.45, with its formation reformed apart from Exeter, who was detached to return to port. Before the British cruiser could escape, Takagi ordered a second mass torpedo attack, focused on trying to sink the damaged Exeter. Between 5.50 and 6.04, 98 torpedoes were fired from across the Japanese fleet. Not a single one of them hit an Allied target. To add injury to insult, the Japanese destroyer squadrons that had closed the distance to fire their torpedoes soon found themselves under fire from British destroyers emerging from the smokescreen. Electra traded fire with the whole of destroyer squadron 2 before hitting and damaging the destroyer Asagumo, which was forced to temporarily stop in the water. Alas, Electra did not have much time to celebrate this as she was quickly set upon by Minigumo, who rained fire down, eventually sinking Electra at 6.16. After two hours of fighting, Admiral Dorman had got nowhere near the Japanese convoy and had lost two ships. Still, he was determined to press an attack that evening, so swung around to the south, intending to break contact with the Japanese until night fell and then try and reach the convoy under the cover of darkness. Takagi assumed Dorman was returning to port when he turned south, so he was caught off guard when the Allied force suddenly turned to the northeast at 6.31. The Japanese Admiral was quickly informed of this by another float plane and was largely able to reform his squadron by 7 minutes past 7. Complicating this process were the cruisers Nachi and Haguro, which were both stationary while they recovered their float planes and so were slow to regain speed. This meant that Rear Admiral Tanaka's destroyers ended up in the firing line on their own, taking fire from Houston and Perth and launching an unsuccessful volley of torpedoes in return. 
Dorman shifted again to the east, trying to work his way around to the south of the Japanese force so he could attack the convoy. An hour later, the Allied force was steaming westwards, though it was doing so without the four American destroyers under Commander Thomas Binford. Binford unilaterally detached his ships from Dorman's fleet at 9pm, citing low fuel and a shortage of torpedoes, though it is also possible he was concerned about following Dorman into an unwinnable fight. At 9.25, the destroyer Jupiter struck a mine and sank, leaving Dorman with just the four cruisers under his control and the damaged destroyer Encounter limping along behind. A new Japanese floatplane arrived overhead, this time from the light cruiser Naka, dropping flares to mark the position of the Allied fleet. Dorman's ships were outnumbered, low in ammunition, and the enemy knew exactly where they were, but he was still determined to press home an attack on the convoy come what may. At 2 minutes past 11, a lookout on the Japanese cruiser Nachi spotted Allied ships in the darkness, about 16,000 yards to the southeast. Rear Admiral Takagi quickly swung his force around to steam north, ordering torpedoes to be loaded as Allied shells began to splash nearby at 11.10. Japanese guns thundered in return 11 minutes later, and shortly afterwards, the final torpedo salvo of the day was launched. 14 minutes later, a torpedo from Nachi impacted Java's aft magazine, causing a tremendous explosion that consumed the ship and sank it within two minutes. Of 528 crew, just 19 survived. Rear Admiral Dorman, believing the torpedo threat had now passed, then turned De Reuter to starboard, unwittingly steaming directly into the path of four torpedoes that had been fired by the Aguro. There was a huge explosion, followed by fire and the loss of electrical power. De Reuter's demise would take longer, but have the same result, with the ship slipping below the waves at 2.30 in the morning. 344 crew went down with her, including Rear Admiral Dorman, who refused to leave his ship. With De Reuter and Java hit, the cruisers Perth and Houston had quickly turned away, making for the port of Tanjong Priok to regroup. The Allied striking force was shattered, and the way was clear for the Japanese invasion of Java. Over the next few days, the remaining Allied ships in Java would try to escape. Some were successful, like the dash of Commander Binford's destroyers through the Bali Strait on the night of March 1st. Others did not get so lucky. To the west of Java, both Perth and Houston were sunk in the Sunda Strait on the same night. And the following morning, the damaged Exeter and two destroyers tried desperately to escape in an ultimately fateful westward dash along the entire length of Java. All around Java, any remaining Allied ships were hunted down and defeated, as the final Allied position in the East Indies collapsed. In just a couple of months, Japan had swept through the region, while the Allied powers had been unable to halt or even really delay their opponents. Allied ships had been unable to sink anything larger than a minesweeper and had taken grievous losses themselves. Japan was now unquestionably the master of Southeast Asia, and it would take a very long time to change that.